Up, yes. Awesome. I, well, guys, it's good to be here. I don't see a screen. I just see everybody on gonna, the viewpoint. Oh, you see everybody on this. Okay, that's what you're seeing. Let me go ahead and share my screen then. And uh, you guys will be able to see this presentation. Let's see. Share screen. Also make sure um, for those of you, if you're not um, actually talking, make sure you mute yourself so that it doesn't interact with any videos or anything that Nathan's trying to present for us, okay? Okay, we're gonna get this chat box up here too. Can everybody see that that screen now? Um, yes. The presentation. We can see everything. Now. Yes. We everything. can see okay. your emails and everything on there. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I could see the chat option here. There we go. Perfect, you guys. Well, my name is Nathan Osmond, and uh, and I'm excited to be here with everyone. And which camera am I looking at? Am I looking at? Uh, did I just turn off my camera? That's okay. You can see my presentation. I got my business partner here. His name is Mike Daniel. Mike, uh, you want to come on up here and introduce yourself a little bit? We just want to introduce everybody to who we are. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Hey, everybody. I'm Mike. Our moderator. I'm Mike, the, the room moderator today. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm partnering up with, with uh, Nathan. We have a lot of fun together. Um, you want to know about, what about me? I'm married, two kids. Uh, oh, there's my slide. Uh, love cars. Well, say I like mac and cheese at, with hot dogs. Um, doesn't say broccoli, but I also like broccoli in my macaroni and cheese with my hot dogs. Um, but yeah, I have a background in software engineering, computer science. I love systems. I love numbers. I love, yeah. He is a problem solver. That's one thing we love about Mike is, is he gets the job done. And we've been working together for the past two years, right? Yep. And uh, one thing is so great is that you think you know somebody, right? You work with them for two years and then you become business partners. Mike is the guy that's put together all of our systems for the elite mortgage team, the elite mortgage group at Security on Mortgage. And uh, it's awesome to have somebody that's so organized working with me. Uh, it's so great to have you here, Mike. Thank you for being here. He's going to jump in and help out with the presentation as well. But my name's Nathan Osmond, and I am from Utah, from American Fork. I'm a father of four sons who just went back to school. Yes, so excited about that. Hope your kids are going back to school too. You know what? That's what we're doing here today is we're going back to school. We're going to learn how to negotiate like a pro. I come from an entertainment family. Uh, maybe some of you guys remember husbands, uh, Alan, Wayne, Meryl, Jay, Donnie, Marie, and Jimmy. My dad's Alan. So he's the oldest of that performing group. So I'm a little bit country and a little bit rock and roll. Some of you are too young for that reference, but uh, it's just good to be here. I want to share this quote right here. It says, never, uh, it says, let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. I love that quote, John F. Kennedy. You don't get what you want. You get what you negotiate, Harvey McKay. That's a great quote. Would you, who agrees with that? Raise your hand. I can see you guys. Yeah, y'all agree with that statement? How about this one? This comes from the former United States Secretary of Treasury. The most critical thing in a negotiation is to get inside your opponent's head and figure out what he or she is re really wants. And we're going to talk about that today, why that is so important to ask good questions. If you're going to be a good negotiator, you have to know who you're negotiating with, who's the party, what's in it for them. That's a book I think all you guys should go read. I just read it by Joe Polish, and it's such an amazing book. What's in it for them? We're going to talk about a lot of good books that I want you to add to your library if you want to become a good negotiator. Let me ask you guys today and those in person here today, why should we be good negotiators? Makes a better advocate for your client, they say. How about those on Zoom? Go ahead and pipe in. We love to ask questions. This is going to be an open forum today. So I hope that you guys are willing to participate. The more you do, the faster it's going to fly. And by the way, are you guys okay? Because by law here in Utah, they require us to take a 10-minute break for every hour we teach. Are you okay? We just plug through and get you out of here about 20 minutes early. Can everybody raise yes. your hand on that one? I've got 100% yeses. Awesome. Very good. We're going to go ahead and do that. But I want to open this up and make this a great discussion today. Why should we be great negotiators? I want to hear somebody on Zoom. Go ahead and pipe in. That's our fiduciary duty. To I'm be better so. for our customer. Yeah, they're hiring you for a reason. You're getting paid 6% for a reason. And a lot of people don't know what it is that you do, right? How many of you guys have ever said, hey, I got a guy that'll do it for 1%. Would you guys match that? Who's ever had that happen to them? Interesting. I've seen some hands raised. 
Is that a good time to be a good negotiator? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> okay. So let's start it off with that question. Hey, I know a guy that'll do it for 1%. Will you match that pipe? And who's the first one to negotiate with me? Should we negotiate? Yeah. No. They say, here, yes. Like, what, what can we do to combat that obstacle right there, right here? I, I think you can be a full service agent and you can show them what you offer. Sure. Mm -hmm. She's saying, show them what value you're worth and why you're worth that percentage. What question could you pose to the person that just threw that at you? What are they willing to do for one percent? I hear. How about on Zoom? What do you guys think? What question could you ask? What services do you want me to remove in order to get down to one percent? Yeah. So can, let me ask you a question. What is it that you think that I do? Because some people don't understand. If you think that all I'm doing is taking pictures of your house and uploading it on a website, yeah, I would be asking that same question too. But explain to me what you think it is that I do for you. You know, and then you can explain your value. And 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 I had one person the other day on this very same class say this: If you got a guy that'll do it for one percent, why are you talking to me? And you can say, you know, I bet you're a lot like me, and you probably notice this in life that you get what you pay for. Would you agree with that statement? Right. So we by asking great questions, we can become great negotiators. Just like my friend Andy Andrews, you got to read his books. He's got some amazing books, New York Times bestsellers. He told me that one time. He says, Nathan, the quality of our, our answers is determined by the quality of our questions. Are we asking the right questions? We're going to get into a book here called Exactly What to Say. And there's a version for realtors. You guys should all go get this book. And I'm going to post some questions for you and show you by wordsmithing, by using the right power of our words, we can control the conversation. The key to great negotiating is helping others get your way. I'm going to introduce a book to you guys called Never Split the Difference. And it was written by a gentleman who, uh, who actually was the head negotiator for hostage situations for the FBI. So we're going to show you guys how you can utilize tactical empathy to really help people get what it is that you want and never split the difference. So you're going to see why he named the book that. But how many of you today have already had a negotiation situation? Anybody? Today. today. Who's willing to share how you negotiated already today? We can negotiate whether we're going to be able to get our breaks or take breaks. Yeah. Do you guys notice how we, we did a little situation there? By law, the state requires me to take a 10 minute break for every hour that we teach. All in favor for taking 20 minutes off by just plugging through. You guys all agreed. You see how we negotiated? I got 100% yeses on that. I thought about what's in it for you guys. You get out of here faster. And unfortunately, for some of you guys that aren't here, guess what? You're not going to get the food that's coming from IBEX. We've got a great sponsor is coming today. But the scope of this class is to really help everybody become a great negotiator, help you to understand your duties pertaining to the Utah Code governing real estate agents. We also want to bring in the code of ethics as well and talk about our fiduciary responsibilities. That was the first word that came out of the Zoom here today was fiduciary. It's our fiduciary responsibility to be a good negotiator because if I'm talking to you and the first thing out of your mouth is, hey, I got a guy that'll do it for 1%. Would you guys match that? And I, I cave. What does that make me look like to the person who's now hiring me? I should be paid 1% if I say yes to that. If I can't negotiate with my own client, how in the world am I going to negotiate with others for your home? You know what I'm saying? You want to wow them. And, and the key is don't cave on that. If you don't know what value you bring to the marketplace, maybe you should be paid 1%. But you guys are all 6%ers. So let's get in the game and show you how you can utilize words as power and help understand the whole idea of how to negotiate because it's fun. When you guys, a lot of people get intimidated when it comes to negotiations. Oh, I don't like confrontation. It's not about confrontation. What was that quote? You got to find out what's in their head. What are they wanting? And knowing how to dig that up, becoming a good listener. How many guys have seen that billboard on the freeway by Ken Garf that says, we hear you. Why have they poured millions of dollars into that campaign? 
They're car salesmen. We are ranked on a list of least trusted uh, professions. Did you know that? They did a whole survey. And we are right down there third to the last. Is there a problem in our industry right now? Hey, Nathan, excuse yes. me. Yes. This is Tana. Um, if you would minimize your screen, we could see you too, if you don't want to be seen. But I think that- Oh, it's fine. Can you see me now? No, but I just wanted you to know that- Oh, yeah. If you want more of a- I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry. No, no, no. It's fine. I, uh, I mean, I would love to be seen, but how do I do that? Like, where's that? Okay. Hold on one second here, Tom. I'll, I'll go ahead and throw that on. Second one on the top. Right where? That start, start video. Can you guys see me now? There we are. Okay. Yes, I got my glasses on now. All right. Perfect. So let's go back up here and get this on here. So uh, I, just, I just thought of a good objection handler for the 1% commission. Hey, I want to hear it. Let's hear it. Uh, I'd be happy to reduce my commission by 66% if you reduce your price by the same. <laughs> so what did he just do right there? Where did you come up with that? Like what's in it for them, right? Yeah. Everybody's tuned into the same radio stations, WIFM. What's in it for me? And if you can show some tactical empathy right there and just say, okay, uh, you, you know, it seems to me that that's an important thing, price, right? And, and then you can, we're going to talk about this with this whole Chris Voss book. You guys never split the difference. The key is to get them to say, that's right. And I got a whole video I'm going to play for you about that. But the thing is, he ascertained some pain. He kind of threw it back in their lap. Let's, let's reverse roles here for a second. Would you, would you, would I ever ask you to do that for your property price? Heck no, right? We're on the same team. So in life, we get what we pay for. Would you agree with that statement? Awesome. Let me explain uh, some of the things that I'm going to be doing for your team. Now, if you don't like that 6%, you tell me which one of these items is most important to take off the list. How quickly do you want to sell this house? Do you want to get top dollar for it? Let me explain my value. But uh, we're always in negotiations, even with my kids today, you know, get them out of bed. Sometimes we have negotiations with ourselves. Should I eat that cupcake or not? You know what I'm saying? But the key is, is you've got to get into the head of the person that you're helping. Um, if the property's not selling, you're not, uh, you're negotiating with your seller on the next steps. Is once you go under contract, these are just some scenarios, guys. And by the way, would you guys be okay if I send you all these slides? Do so you have all these? Is that all right? I'll make sure that after we're done here, Tana, I'll send you this, this presentation here. We can pass it on to everybody. But the key to great negotiations is having some fun. I've talked to great business people that I've worked with in the past. And, you know, they get together and rarely do they ever, except for maybe the last five minutes of their get together, their lunch meeting, do they even bring up the business. Here they've flown across the country to be there, to meet with a person. And guess what happens? They just chat it up, they laugh, they talk, they have fun, they go on the golf course, whatever it is that they're doing. And once they build that rapport with that person, then the negotiations start. They're typically between five to 10 minutes and the deal's done, the handshake. But I got to tell you this, you're always on. See, in show business, we've always learned that. Like, always be on. Because you never know who you're working with and always be kind to everyone. Not only is that your fiduciary responsibility, but let me tell you a story about my friend, Randy Garn, who's a great businessman here in Utah. He told me a story on my podcast. He says, Nathan, we were going out to New York City. We're meeting with this really important gentleman and this big high rise. We're super excited. We're running a little bit late. I had two other guys with me, you know, and we go to get in the elevator and there's this lady standing there with this big basket of bread and cupcakes and muffins and stuff like that. And because they were in such a hurry, one of the guys with him said something rude to this lady, like, come on, lady, You're like we're in a hurry. Just something simple like that, right? It was a little bit rude to this lady. Well, it's interesting that she pushed the same floor that they were going up to. You see where this is going? So the lady gets out in the elevator, goes into the same offices and works, makes her way back to the back because they had to stop and talk to the receptionist. The receptionist brings them into the boardroom. And then a few minutes later, the man they flew all the way across the country to go meet with and negotiate with comes walking in. He says, uh, gentlemen, we have a problem. 
the lady with the basket happens to be my wife. And she just told me how you treated her in the elevator. If that's the way you're going to treat someone who could do nothing for you, then we have no business doing business. Have a nice day. Bam. So guys, always treat everybody with respect. You never know who you're talking to. I have a friend who told me this story. He was leaving a hotel and this man who was uh, taking all the bags and putting them in the back, you know, he was yelling at this old guy who was going to drive my friend to the airport. And so what happened was he, he was just bound, you know, dumbfounded by the way this man was treating this old guy. And so and he, when he got in the car, they started driving to the airport. My friend says, how can you sit there and let that man treat you that way? That's just not right. And the man who was driving my friend to the airport just laughed. He says, it's all good. I do this for fun. You see, the man that just yelled at me doesn't realize that I, I own that hotel. Uh, I think there was a firing that day. But the point is, is you never know who you're going to work with. Always be good. Never burn a bridge because the people that you work with on the way up are the same people you're going to work with on the way down. So always be good to people. Have fun with it, too. Uh, we negotiate all the day long. And uh, we always got to find ways to create win-win scenarios. So let's talk about this. Uh, let's talk about the ad addendums. Can I just say that, Mike? And you can come up here and share why it's important that we don't do our negotiations on addendums. Uh, I, I should get a big amen for that, especially from the lender standpoint, because if you put something on an addendum and it doesn't get addressed, what happens with that item? Go ahead and pipe in if you have the answer. Deal can be jeopardized. Yeah. Is it part of the deal now? If you want something struck from an addendum, what has to be created? Another addendum. And so if we say, I'm, I want you to do this, and the other person says, I don't want you to do this, so I want this in the deal, and then now you're down to addendum number three, sometimes you forget to add what was on the previous two addendums. Now you're already on addendum three, and you're just starting your negotiations. From a paperwork standpoint, from a lender standpoint, Mike, is that dangerous? Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've had people that say, hey, you're going to fix this uh, radon mitigation system. And the person says, no, we're not. And then you get to three and four and five. What is the underwriter's viewpoint from that conversation, from those addendums? You put it on the addendum. Someone's paying for a radon mitigation system, period. You're only jeopardizing your deal and lengthening the time by, by negotiating on addendum. So what's a better route? So I, I had, when I was first new. Okay. Can you guys hear her? Okay, so when I was first like a new no. agent, this was probably like my third deal I was doing. I, had, I, I was selling a home for a for sale by owner. She was selling a home by a for sale by owner when she was brand new. And they didn't have an agent. The, um, we negotiated with them in an addendum. They negotiated an addendum and they said that if um like we wanted them to pay a closing cost, our closing mm -hmm. costs. They wanted them to pay the closing costs. The guy doesn't know what he's doing and so he don't know what they're doing and he just crosses it out in writing. Costs. And he says no closing costs. He wasn't wanting to pay so they go to closing, he wasn't wanting to pay any closing costs, including his own. So guess, up so, so guess who ended up paying closing costs? Hey, what? Yeah. So the thing is, if you learn anything today from this from this class is do not do the negotiating on, on the addendums. Call that listing agent. Talk to them. Start up a conversation. Say, tell me what your needs are. Like, let's just get it out of the open. And by the way, when you're working with your, 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 your peeps, your clients, you may want to talk to them. Yeah, shoot for the moon, right? But but there are exceptions because how quickly do you want to sell this home? If it's not a structural issue or those types of things, let's maybe meet in the middle a little bit more there, okay? Uh, repair addendums. You know, uh, anything that is put on addendum for repair, guys, with the exception of two items down below, uh, which are weather related. These, are, these came after COVID, right? Um, typically those are uh, escrowed in about 10% or 20% are escrowed. You have about 180 days. Also, you just need to, um, just, just, just talk to your clients, but talk to that listing agent. If you're a buyer's agent 
and and have those conversations on the phone or in person and let's just let's come to the 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 meeting table okay let's come together and negotiate but let's be reasonable that's really the key just keep it reasonable get those conversations done write it down why is that important to write things down Do you remember what was negotiated? See, what makes a contract a contract? Can I write a contract on a piece of toilet paper? Yes. The paper is not what makes it legal tender or, or legal. What is it? If I can get a signature and I can get something notarized, we're now legal, right? That's how you, you don't even have to be an attorney to, to make something legal. You just have to be able to do those two things. So if you can get a signature, get it notarized and, and put a stamp on something, you guys could create all sorts of legal structures. But this is our fiduciary responsibility. So part of this presentation is to discuss what is our fiduciary responsibility. Um, and I'm going to give you a hint as to how to remember this. How many guys remember in the test you took about old car? You guys, do you guys remember that? Old car? In fact, you know what, Tana, should we go ahead and just make that word number one? Let's go ahead and make this word number one so you'll always remember your fiduciary responsibilities, and that is old car. You can see right here on the screen what it stands for, and that is obedience, loyalty, disclosure, confidentiality, accounting, and reasonable care. So there you got your old car acronym. And let's go ahead and break this down. Obedience, okay? An agent is obligated to obey promptly and efficiently all lawful instructions of his or her principal. However, this duty plainly does not include an obligation to obey any unlawful instructions. So am I obligated to do what my client wants? They say, as long as it's lawful. What, what about you guys on Zoom? Yes. Are there any exceptions to that rule? No. What if they ask me to be dishonest? I was just going to say, I'm not going to do anything illegal for any client. <laughs> yeah. We just taught the three-hour uh, code of ethics class the other day out in Tooele. And one lady says, I'm not going to do anything that will, I'm not going to go to jail for you. Okay. Is the way that she liked to put it. Uh, orange is a great color, but not on me. Okay. So I'm not going to do anything that's unlawful, unethical, any of those things. So anything within the law, I'm more than happy to go to bat and I represent you. I've got your six, as they say in the military, I got your back, right? Unless they try to get you to do anything illegal or unlawful. So that is uh, our first letter in old car. Now let's talk about loyalty. Why is that important? Why is loyalty important? They can know that you have their back. They need to know you're on their side. If you're representing them, they you do everything out for their best interest. They need to know that you're looking out for their best interest. How about on Zoom? Tell me about loyalty. Is it is it common today? People turn on each other all the time. People have to build trust. If we got a trust issue, and we do, you saw the list, third to the bottom, we got a problem. There was a lady I heard, you probably heard of her name, Jen. She works here. She spoke about that women's uh, real estate group. Uh, I went and had, had a chance to listen to her. I'm a big fan of Jen. And she said that out loud. She says, we've got a problem in this business. That's why she's raising the bar every single day here, guys. The problem is, is that people don't trust us. They look at us as salespeople, right? And they're right down there in the third bottom as well. The point is, is that what are people hearing on the news right now about real estate? Chime in. What are you guys hearing? You're on the front lines. What are people saying about buying a house? What kind of objections are you getting right now? Rates are crazy. It's a horrible time to buy all the negative. Yeah. Anyone else? What other objections? Frustrate. The frustrate. Interest rates are too high, and it'd be hard to find something the same value yeah. that I'd be selling the house for. I'm just waiting for house prices to come down. Did you know that if somebody says that, you can inform them, well, it already happened, and they're on the rebound. Did you know that there is a shortage of real estate across the whole country, not just Utah? 
Did you know that Fortune Magazine right now just projected that by 2024, rates should be down in the fives? And in, by 2024, it's be down in the fours. 2025 will be down the fours. So if we know that, if that's what they're projecting, could they be wrong? Yes. But there's a guy named Dave Ramsey who just said this out loud publicly that right now is the best time to buy a home in the next five years. Why would he say that? Mr. Conservative, why would Dave Ramsey say that? He says a lot of people are concerned about these high interest rates. He says, don't not buy the house, buy the house. And if interest rates come down, refinance, close quote, Dave Ramsey, I'd be sharing that with every Utah. They love him here, right? But why did he say that? And you can educate people. You see how education opens the, the windows to opportunity? When I can sit down and explain to something, did you know that in 1996 across the Wasatch Front, the average house price here in Utah was $119,000. Boy, I bet they thought that was expensive back then. And if you think that house prices are expensive right now, you're waiting for them to come down. First of all, you missed it, and it's already on the rebound. They already jumped up 30,000. It fell down 100,000, up 30. But let me just tell you this. Guys, they're projecting Salt Lake City to double in the next 10 years. Have you been to the airport? Oh, that thing's huge. I go through that all the time. And the thing is, is that why did they build that big airport? What are they expecting here in Utah? You know, Robert Spenlow was speaking today at a conference for the Chamber of Commerce. I'm tied in with them. You know, he told me last time, we have 3 million jobs here and we're waiting for people to fill them in Utah. So the job opportunities are huge. People are flooding to Utah. We we're just voted number one state in America, thank you, World News and Weekly Report. That's awesome. So if we can start educating people, because my own father sent me a text message and all my brothers, don't anybody buy a house right now. Glenn Beck just said so. Are we sheep in this country? We are. And I love Glenn, but here's the point. You got to do your thinking for yourself. And if we can educate and explain why right now is a great time, because if you think the house prices are high now, as inflation starts to come down, what happens to the interest rates? They always follow, right? So keep your eye on the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, guys. You're going to see some amazing things. We have to teach people that inflation is man-made. Do we forget that sometimes? Oh, we have no control over it. Yes, we do. And it's quite interesting as we're coming upon what was called an election year. If you look at history, and I love history, it was Winston Churchill who said that if we fail to learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it. Well, watch this. Almost always in election years, amazing things just magically happen. They love to get their votes and they want to be on the minds with positive news, especially as people are about to go to ballot boxes. So isn't it interesting that right now they're starting to project, hey, coming up, it's coming down, get ready for it, right? People will get excited about those types of things. But what happens when inflation and interest rates come down, especially when there's a shortage of housing across the country? What do you guys predict is going to happen? Prices will go up. If you thought it was bad two years ago, just wait. Now, what would you rather have? Lower house prices and higher interest rates or the alternative? You see how we just posed a question right there? When we can educate and train people. By the way, it, how important is it when you're doing negotiations to know your areas? Okay, tell me about Panguitch, Utah. <laughs> you know a lot about Panguitch. That's, I've tried to stump you guys. But if you don't know a lot about Panguitch and you're a Utah realtor, where can you go to get educated really quickly on Panguitch, Utah? Does anybody have any suggestions for me? How can I know the market in Panguitch right now? Go to Panguitch. Ask to the people Panguitch. that live in Panguitch. But what if I'm on the phone right now and this is the difference between me getting the deal and not getting the deal? You get on the MLS. Search on the Google. Search okay. on the Google. I heard Google. I heard MLS. Do you mind if I give you guys a really cool free website? I want you to write this down. Bestplaces.net. Make sure you put net. Bestplaces.net is a fantastic website. I worked with Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank. I represented his brand, Josh Altman for Million Dollar Listing, a lot of the HGTV guys. And as I went across the country and I talked to people about their markets, I showed up in places like Scranton, Pennsylvania. Now, I knew The Office was from there. I love that show. But what else do I know besides that, Joe Biden? I know this. I know I can go to bestplaces.net and it'll tell me right now what the median house price range is right now. 
It'll tell me the median income price or, or, or what people make there in that town of Scranton right now. Why would that be important? Especially if I'm talking to a real estate investor, would that be good information? It tells me the, the, the ratios between Mormons and Catholics and Protestants in the town of Scranton, Pennsylvania, the crime levels, the elementary schools. Now, when I click on real estate, it'll take me to, to Zillow. So watch out there. But here's the point. When you have the right tools at your hands, it's amazing what can happen. It's amazing when you can look like a pro and, and people can build confidence in you that you're going to seal the deal. I mean, when you talk to people right off the bat before they sign your little agreement, they have to believe that you know what you know. And sometimes it's just having the right tools and the right answers at the right time or asking the right questions that are going to separate you from the winners from the losers. Because you're on stage where people are looking at you. That is a negotiation. You've got to sell them. So having the right information, go to that MLS, study your market updates, know what's going on so that you can have those answers right off the bat because you won't always have that in front of you. So I encourage about 30 minutes a day if you guys will study the market analysis, know your towns, get in the game. But you got to show that you're loyal to your, to your clients there. How about disclosure? Let's talk about the D in old car. Are we allowed to disclose everything? Yeah. You always, there's that loyalty, right? You, you, there are certain things that can be disclosed. Now, could you ever tell the other person, hey, I think the person would accept less. They got two house, house payments. They're building out an Eagle Mountain. Could, they, could you disclose that? With their permission. There it is. There it is. The answer is it depends. And that's almost always the safe answer to every question. It depends. It's got to be in writing, first and foremost. If they give you permission to disclose something like that, then yes, you can disclose that. But why is it important for us to not disclose certain things? It affects the value of the property. Yeah. Is it your job? Who's the gentleman that just spoke up? Jesse. Jesse. Is it your job, Jesse, to to be an expert at finding faults with the property? Is that your job? No. No, whose job is that? Uh, house inspector. Yeah, but Jesse, if you spot a crack in the foundation, is it your fiduciary duty to disclose that? Yes. To both parties? Yes. Yes, see something, say something, but just understand your role. Because sometimes we try to handle more than one role. But the key is, is you, there are certain things that you can and cannot disclose. I think we're beating a dead horse with that. Let's talk about confidentiality. An agent is obligated to safeguard his or her principal's confidence and secrets. A real estate broker, therefore, must keep confidential any information that might weaken his or her principal's bargaining position if it were revealed. Um, you know, and the thing is, is that you've got to just, you, I served in a bishop, Rick, so I know a lot of things about my neighbors they don't want others to know. And it's so easy. Have you guys noticed here in Utah, we love to chat and talk to each other about our neighbors. That's not just Utah, that's worldwide. And I tell you this, when somebody knows that you've got their six, I do a lot with our veterans. That's a, that's a military term. What does it mean to have somebody six? Do you know what that means? You've got their back. You've got their back. Looking up at 12, what's right behind you? Yeah, it's your back, it's six. And so confidentiality, um, you know, if you're a reporter off the record type stuff, you know, you have to be trustworthy. I'm an Eagle Scout. You went to Scouts, didn't you? Did you get your Eagle? Yeah. Mike's an Eagle. Mike, what is the Scout law? Scout is? Trustworthy, loyal, helpful, courteous, kind of lead, thrifty, brave, clean, reverent. Yeah, Scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, brave. No, no, I messed it up. Clean and reverent, right? Is that right? I messed that up too. Anyways, but the key is, is that we have to be trustworthy. It's the first thing in the scout law. Uh, there's eight boys in my family. My mother earned eight Eagle Scouts. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> but let's make sure that we're confidentiality secure there. Uh, how about accounting? This is an important thing, especially when we're negotiating with people. They have to know they can trust us with their money. Accounting, an agent is obligated to account for all money and property belonging to his or her principal that is entrusted to him. Let's talk about earnest money, okay? So in order to be able to teach the mandatory residential class and the, the code of ethics class, I had to go to a two-day class, two days. If you think three hours is long, try sitting two days of this. 
just to have the rights to teach this. Now, we talked about a lot of scenarios up there. We had an agent who shared a story and we thanked him for sharing it. He says, when I was a brand new agent, I, uh, I went to go get some earnest money. By the way, how many days legally do you have to get that earnest money turned in? Four. I'm hearing four, four calendar days. That's how long you have to get it. But legally, you actually have four more to get it in. Just so you know, I know that some people say, don't tell them that. I'd rather just get it in day one. But the point is, this gentleman picked, had forgotten to pick up the, uh, the earnest money. And thank goodness he had a responsible broker who came knocking on his door. Hey, dude, did you get the, the earnest money? Oh, shoot, it's day four. I'm going to go get it right now. So he was so excited, ran over there, got it. So glad to have it in his possession. And he took it to the title office. He dropped it off there at title. And he thought, oh, we're good. Dun, dun, dun. Fast forward a couple of weeks. The seller's agent says, hey, you know what? We got a better offer on the table. We're going to cancel this one. We're going to go with them. But you can't do that. I got earnest money. What earnest money? I dropped it off of the title. Did you write an addendum? He had forgotten a very important step. When you take earnest money to a title company, what are you obligated to fill out? An addendum. And he did not do that. So he realizes, oh my gosh, I messed up royal, royally and my clients are in a bad position because of my ineptness. I'm going to own this mistake and I'm going to go knock on their door and I'm going to tell them that I'm sorry we can't get your house because of my mistake. So he drives up to their house and it, the story gets much worse. What does he see parked out in front of this house? Moving vans. See, this family was so excited for this house. They given the earnest money. They had about two weeks left on their uh, lease. So what they did is they were moving into a hotel before they went to go move into their house. And this realtor had to break the news to them that I hope you like the Motel 6 because that's where you're going to be living. They'll leave the light on for you. I messed up. You see what I'm saying? So when we handle people's money, we have to take that seriously. We have to know our duty. As you're explaining your duty to people and what it is that you do, you start to build that 6% value. Yes. I'm confused. Are you not under contract with only receivers? The earnest money, if it's not filed with an addendum, they can change their minds. They can go with somebody else, the title company. Yeah, so you have to get that turned in. So you can't tell that your brokerage did that. Well, there's an addendum that needs to be handed in. Yeah. Yeah. So a step was missed in that in this scenario. And if you skip a step in this business, what could happen? He never. He never filled out the addendum. And so because of that one mistake, legally, they had the right to cancel that and go with a better offer because that, that timing had passed. We have deadlines. And there are certain rules and certain paperwork that needs to be filled out. But since we're talking about accounting, that's always been a great story. We thanked him for his mistake because you guys will never, ever, ever forget to fill out that addendum, will you? So we thanked him for sharing that story. Let's talk about the last letter in old that's car. Is, yes, sir. Um, we saw the Google Docs. So isn't this supposed to be end of the slide? The Google Docs? Yes. Tana is going to put that up here at the end in order to get credit for that. Uh, All right, Tana, you're going to be putting that up on the screen. The Google Doc. We're going to give you these slides, so you'll have all of this in front of you. Okay. No, no, no. I mean, do we need to fill out the Google Doc now or end up the slide? Tana, is that at the end? Okay. Yeah, when it's all over, I'm just putting it in there so that you can have it yeah so we'll make sure that we feel that out of the end i want everybody in here to get credit for your two hours we want to thank you for your time time is your greatest commodity by the way because you can always get more money right but when somebody gives you your time you know at the end of his life steve jobs no matter how much money he had he could not buy more time his last dying words were oh wow oh wow oh wow he saw something pretty amazing and I just love that. But the thing is, is that he couldn't buy any more time. So when somebody gives it their time, when you go and show a house and you give it your time, first of all, set expectations. 
Don't let people take advantage of you. But just know this. People will appreciate when you give of your time. Hopefully, they'll, they'll express it too. But the thing is, is uh, reasonable care and diligence. This ties in with time. An agent is obligated to use reasonable care and diligence in pursuing the principal's affairs. What does the word reasonable mean? Can you get taken advantage of in this business? Can you set proper expectations? See, the biggest thing in the mortgage world, you know, we tell people, yeah, hey, we, can, we can get you closed in three weeks and we close in four. They hate our guts. So we say, yeah, we can get closed in three weeks and we close in two and a half. They love us. It's interesting. So always set expectations, but reasonable care. This is so important. The standard of care expected of a real real estate broker representing a seller or buyer is that of a competent real estate professional. You know, you guys have this little R that you wear on your on your lapels. You know, we're, we're not allowed to wear that R because we haven't earned that. You have gone to school. You're sitting in these classes. You're expected to have how many? 19 hours of CE every two years. Guys, that means something. And people need to be reminded of this. This is my final thought, uh, Jerry Springer here. But you, the key is you you got to live up to that R, right? People need to R, respect that. But we have to do our duty, our fiduciary responsibilities of old car. And I'd like to actually add an extra letter, and that's E, education, old care. That's what they should call it. But uh, anyways, do your fiduciary duties of a real estate agent apply to third parties? Answer is no. But you guys, just learn what your responsibility is. Now, let's get back to negotiations. A negotiation in the classic sense assumes parties more anxious to agree than to disagree. I agree with that. Um, I'm going to punch, punch ahead to this one right here. Why is it important that we think in terms of win-win when it comes to a negotiation? Who wants to respond to that question? Both party agreed without, uh, without any hassle. Yeah. Are there any losers in a win-win? And when, when, no, because they are both uh, negotiate their rights um, on their their level. Absolutely. You know what? When people are honest and forthcoming and always watching out for each other, I sat in this room here and I always like to just be upfront with people, right? I always want to make sure they're winning. I tell people, Mike and I have a little standard here. And that is if we wouldn't recommend our own mamas get that loan, we won't, we won't recommend that your mama get that loan, right? If somebody says, I want to, I want to, refinance my house. Okay, time out, Tiger. Let's look, at, let's look at the numbers. Let's see if it makes sense. What are your plans in the next five years? Are you planning to move in the next two years? It may not be advantageous for you to do that. Some people are saying, hey, I want to refinance right now. I want to do a cash out. Uh, can I mind, do you mind if I ask you what your, your going rate is right now? What, what interest rate are you locked in at right now? Two and a half. What should I advise them to do if I'm watching out for their best interest? It's such a great asset right now. So the key is ask good qualifying questions, but always, always, always think in terms of win-win. You see, I had a guy named Steve Perry. You ever heard of that guy? I just said hi to him here today. He's an awesome dude. You know, when I came here and taught a class, we started talking about um, HELOCs, home equity line of credits. And guess what? He says, Nate, I need to go do a HELOC. I says, and I said, perfect. I said, you know what? Let me get you on the phone here with either Matthew or, or UCCU. We got some good people there because their HELOC program is, is a little bit better than ours, okay? Now, if you want to do a cash out refi, ding, 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 I'm your guy. But he asked me about that, right? He heard me talking about this during the presentation. So after he came up and said, Nate, I need to get a HELOC. So I said, perfect. Let me get you on the phone with these guys. And you know what? I earned his trust because I practiced what I preached in my presentation. You got to be consistent and always watch out, create win-win scenarios. The best move that you can make in a negotiation is to think of an incentive the other person hasn't thought of and then meet. Who wants to comment on that, on that quote right there? Anybody had that experience before you can share something with us? Have you ever thought of an incentive that the other person hadn't thought of and you brought it up and you met it before they'd ever brought it up? Mike, what would that do in a negotiation? Um, I think that's a winning, that's a winning negotiation. Is that, is that win-win? Is that going to put you in a good light? Will they trust you more that you're not trying to take advantage of them? Yes. I've had some. 
some experience of this when it comes to like her cell biometrics. She's had some experience of this with FISBOs. Don't think that they need to if it's something that you're able to sanitize them with stuff they had not yeah. thought of. Okay. She's saying that she's had a lot of success with this with for sale by owners because those people are selling their home by owner for a reason, right? They're either trying to get every last penny out of this. They don't think that 6% is necessary to pay you, but you've been very successful in talking to people for sale by owners and explaining to them why it would be advantageous for them to work with the realtor. What are some of the benefits that you shared with those people? One of the big things that I think catches people's attention is security. Security. Like they don't think about that. Part. They don't think about that. Okay. Um, but also, like. Also. How much you'll market above and beyond. How much you'll market above and beyond. Planning on it. Mm -hmm. Listing price usually. The listing price. What about what about people that are working as with like say you're a buyer's agent. And somebody doesn't want to work with a with a buyer's agent because they think they have to come out of pocket and pay that person. Most people don't know that the sellers are paying for the buyer's agent, right? So if we could just educate them, are they more likely to get sued or go through some bad situations without the help of a licensed professional like yourself? If you can ascertain the pain and explain your value and, and the fact that the seller's paying for it anyways, so they're not having to come out of pocket for that, is that called education or are we educating the, the, the public? Yes. And this is stuff I wish they would have taught us in high school, right? We're not taught this. So we can't blame the general public for not knowing this, but is it our fiduciary responsibility to explain these things? Yes. So think of things that you can incentivize the other person of something maybe they didn't think about and hook a brother up. It's awesome. Let's talk about tactical empathy. I'm going to play a video now. Tana, will you make sure, give me the thumbs up if you can hear the audio on this. This is Chris Voss. This is a kind of a recap on this book called Never Split the Difference. We're going to watch this video and then we're going to discuss it. Check it out. Can you hear that? I recently read the book, Never Split the Difference. I recently read the book, Split Chris the Difference. Voss. Hold on. Several years ago, author Chris Voss. Let's see, do you know make the audio was that a thumbs up could you hear that yeah you fixed it oh good okay perfect let's go ahead and play that again i recently read the book never split the difference by author chris boss several years ago author chris boss was invited to a negotiating class at harvard the class instructor asked chris to conduct a mock negotiation with one of the Harvard students. In this mock negotiation, Chris was selling a product, and his counterpart was given a set budget to buy the product. Chris and the Harvard student went back and forth until they arrived at an agreed price. When the instructor walked up to them and asked, what was the price you agree upon? Chris told her, and she immediately burst out laughing. She said, Chris, you literally got every dime he had. The instructor was used to seeing her students split the difference between the minimum selling price the seller was given and the max budget the buyer was given. But somehow, author Chris Voss had convinced his negotiated counterpart to willingly offer his entire budget. To see if it was a fluke, the instructor had Chris negotiate a different student the following day. And again, Chris walked away with the maximum amount. These Harvard students knew every cutting edge negotiating technique in the book. So how did Chris Voss convince them to give him their entire budget? Well, Chris wasn't just some guy off the street. Chris was the lead hostage negotiator for the FBI. And after dozens of high stakes negotiations with kidnappers around the world, Chris Voss found that the key to getting what he wanted and avoiding compromises and making the other side feel like they were treated fairly was tactical empathy. Tactical empathy is the act of sincerely empathizing with your counterpart's situation and then getting them to empathize with your situation. Let me tell you why demonstrating sincere empathy is critical to negotiation and how giving and receiving empathy is the key to walking away from a negotiation with the best possible price, best possible salary, or the best possible contract while making the other party feel like they were treated fairly. During a psychotherapy session, a psychiatrist will encourage a patient to talk while she listens intensely. Occasionally, the psychiatrist will jump in to help clarify what the patient is saying and feeling. Psychiatrists do this because they know that their patient will be less defensive 
and less opposed to change if they can make them feel heard. The same principle applies to a negotiation. During a negotiation, your counterpart will be uncomfortable dealing with you and resist your counteroffers until you demonstrate that you understand their world and can empathize with their cares and concerns. A woman at Chris Boss's negotiating workshop learned this the hard way. The woman, who we'll call Susan, was a sales rep for a pharmaceutical company. She was attempting to influence a doctor to replace one of the drugs that he was prescribing to his patients with a drug that she was selling. In the first meeting with the doctor, he was cold and skeptical. He told her that nothing would convince him to replace the drug he was already administering his patients. Although this initial sales pitch was going terrible, Susan started to see how deeply he cared for his patients. When he talked about any one of his patients, his body language and tone of voice was noticeably warmer. Mm. Susan pointed it out. You seem very passionate about treating your patients. I can see how hard you work to tailor specific treatments to each and every patient. The doctor paused and looked at her as if he was seeing her for the first time and said, that's right. I feel like I'm treating an epidemic that the other doctors are not picking up on, which means that a lot of patients are not getting treated adequately. From that moment on, the doctor let down his guard and was willing to listen to what Susan had to say. When Susan brought up the positive attributes of her product, he listened closely. By the end of the meeting, the doctor said he was open to trying the new medication, and he placed an order that day. The magical words that turned around Susan's conversation with the doctor were, that's right. Mm -hmm. If you can get your counterpart to say the words, that's right, then you know you've made them feel heard, and you'll know that they'll be more receptive to any offers and counteroffers that you make from that point forward. Author Chris Voss says, a negotiation doesn't truly start until you hear the words, that's right. The best way to get your counterpart to say the words, that's right, is to listen to the emotion behind your counterpart's words. Your goal is to spot some cares and concerns that they have regarding the negotiation, and then summarize those cares and concerns with a concise statement that starts with, it seems like, or it sounds like. As in, it seems like you're really concerned about blank or it sounds like blank is really important to you. The beauty of starting your statements with it seems like or it sounds like is that if you're wrong, you don't damage the conversation since you can follow up with, well, I didn't say that's how it was. It just seems that way. But if your counterpart confirms your summary statement with a that's right, then it's time to get them to empathize with your situation. Chris Voss says the best way to get someone to empathize with your situation and start thinking of ways in which they can help you is to ask calibrated questions. Mm -hmm. Calibrated questions are open-ended questions that start with how or what and are calibrated to direct your counterpart's focus towards your problem. They turn a negotiation from a confrontation to a problem-solving session. Chris Voss says, the ultimate calibrated question is how am I supposed to do that? Let's say you're renting an apartment and your landlord tells you that he's going to increase the rent from $1,200 a month to $1,500 a month. The best way to avoid the rent increase and negotiate a lower rent is to empathize with this position and then ask a version of how am I supposed to do that? You can say, it seems like you think your apartment is undervalued and you just want a fair market price, but how am I supposed to pay $1,500 a month when I only make enough money to afford $1,200 a month? The key is to say, how am I supposed to do that? In the same way you would say, I value your intelligence can you please help me solve my problem? Mm -hmm. At this stage, if you make your counterpart feel heard, you build rapport with them. And when you ask your counterpart the calibrated question, how am I supposed to do that? Your counterpart will most likely do one of two things. They'll either come up with a creative solution so that both of you can get what you value most, or they'll raise or lower their initial demand to accommodate you. If they take option two, but still give you an offer that doesn't meet your needs, you simply respond with a slightly different calibrated question. Back to the rental example, if your landlord reduces his rent to $1,400 a month, you could respond with, that's very generous of you. That's probably the lowest price you can go, but I'm sorry. I just don't see how I'm supposed to pay $1,400 a month to stay here when I can rent a similar apartment nearby for less than $1,200 a month. This technique of politely countering every offer with some version of how am I supposed to do that is precisely how Chris Voss got those Harvard students to willingly offer him their entire budget. Mm. So the next time you go into a negotiation, empathize with their situation and try to get that that's right. Then get them to empathize with your situation and ask them to help solve one of your problems by asking a calibrated question like,
like, how am I supposed to do that? If you do this, you're on your way to mastering the negotiation, which is simply the art of getting someone else to have your way. That was the core message that I gathered from Never Split the Difference. It's a great book on understanding the subtleties of a negotiation. I highly recommend it. If you would like a one-page PDF summary of insights that I gathered from this book. So there we go, guys. Let's discuss this video for a second. What did you get out of that video when it comes to that, that doctor and that, 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 that pharmaceutical rep? What did she do right? Who wants to comment on that on Zoom? She, she had empathy. Empathy, which is, by the way, Tana, word number two, empathy. I hope you guys are writing these down. You got to have all four words to get the credit. So make sure you're paying attention here. Empathy is word number two. What does empathy mean? Anyone? What does it mean to be empathetic? Compassion. Mm. Okay. So how does she show compassion? Compassion. Oh, go ahead. Your guess. You go for it. <laughs> you go. She's being I already did the other two. You get it. <laughs> okay. Empathy to me means, um, you know, you, you're not only compassionate, but you, you understand how the other person feels. Yeah. So what did she do right? It has to do with Ken Garf. We hear you. She finds the need and she, she did the right approach. Okay. Did the doctor feel heard? Yes, because she understands what doctor needs. And how did she express to him that she heard him? She listened. And then she says, it seems to me, right, that you care an awful lot about your patients. Does that, did, that, did that hit his heart a little bit with tactical empathy? Mm -hmm. He says, that's right. And she addressed the need that he didn't even realize. He needed. And she addressed the need that he didn't even realize that he needed. Good comment. So she thought about it before he knew about it, and she inserted that in the conversation. But before she did, she listened well, and she responded with tactical empathy by saying, it seems to me that you care an awful lot about your patients. She Every validated day, him. She validated him. As men, do we need validation? Come on, Jen. You just celebrated an anniversary. How many years? Ten, Ten years. Has your husband ever needed validation? You know, he's way less needed than me. Like, yeah. Yes, we all need it, but especially as men. I know that my wife, she's like, oh my gosh, how many times do I have to tell you you did a good job, right? But it's just a, it's something that we kind of, it's almost an internal need that we, we every one of us needs to feel heard. We need to feel valued in our lives. And as a doctor, he's looking at her from the beginning as a what? A salesperson. Do people like to be sold? But do people love to buy? Yeah. And we need to remember that. But we need to be good listeners. And then, and then and, and repeat back to them what it is that they've shared with us. You see, Chris Voss had this, this, uh, this uh, hospice situation that he was thrown into. And he had like 24 hours or less to get this guy like millions and millions of dollars because he used tactical empathy. Guess what? The guy let the guys go and received zero dollars. He's that good. But you know what he said? It, the, the story continues. A couple of years later, he got a call back and he says, hey, whoever hired Chris Voss deserves a raise because if he can get me to do that, he can get anybody to do anything. Click. The hostage called him and complimented Chris on how good he was at what he does. I think that's such a compliment. You guys have got to go read this book. Never split the difference. It's so good. But I love how she listened. She complimented. It, it seems to me, or it sounds like, you see what you're doing right there? You're wordsmithing. You're using words that dis disarm the other party. Because they say, no, that's not the way I feel. Oh, okay. It just, it just seems like that. Explain some more. Let me listen some more, right? But once people get to the, that's right, if you can kind of repeat back to them what their needs are, what they're looking for, and you get a that's right, bingo, you're on to closing this deal, guys. 
That is a magic two set of words right there. That's right. And you're going to go read that book. You'll see time after time why I mean that's true. But let's talk about uh, other parts of that video, though. What else did you learn from that video? You had the doctor situation, but then you had the landlord situation. What did that person say to the landlord that was wanting to raise his rents? How am I supposed to? Okay, but he also complimented him before he said that. It seems to me that you feel that your property is undervalued and that you need to charge more. Am I right in saying that? That's right. There's the words. Okay. Now, what is he doing? He's trying to get this landlord to help him solve his problem now. Like, help me out here. How am I supposed to do that? Chris Voss uses that term on every hostage situation. How am I supposed to do that? You're, you're asking for help. Are people natural problem solvers or like to pretend they are? Does anybody ever offer their advice to you, Jen, when you don't ever ask for it, <laughs> right? But the point is, but what does that mean to them when somebody is experienced as you takes the time to listen to them? I have an open door policy, right? Yeah. Come on in. They feel valued. You know that validation and feeling valued is the number one reason why people stay with a company. It's not the money. It's not all the, it's the recognition. They want to feel that they're heard. There's a company in Japan right now that gives everybody on Fridays like three hours to go and work on whatever projects they want to work on that can help further our company. Use your creativity. Use that right brain. Bring it to me. I'm the boss. Of, guys, this company is like exploding because they feel like they're valued, that they have an opportunity to share what's, what they can bring to the table. Why do you think trophies are important? Why do, you, why do you think we do that, right? That's the point is that recognition, being heard and being validated is a big part of winning in a negotiation. Um, uh, here's another good question that, uh, that, that Chris teaches. He says, is now a bad time to talk? Why would that be? Is that negative? Is now, why, would, why is it important when you're starting a conversation with somebody to ask a question, is now a bad time to talk? You're checking their mental state of being. Mm. Is it important to negotiate with a person in a good state of being that's non-distracted, not distracted? What do you think? If you're interrupting their dinner with their wife and kids, is that a good time to be talking real estate? You're valuing their time. If you say, is now a good time to talk? It's never a good time to talk. But there's something by using the word bad. See how words are powerful? Is now a bad time to talk? People don't ever want to come off sounding rude. They never say, yeah, that's a bad time to talk. No, so they'll, you're utilizing psychology. So is now a bad time to talk? I challenge you guys to use that this week when you're talking to somebody. And then if, if they say that it is, okay, let's schedule a time. That would be a great time to talk then, you know, bam. And then you get it on the calendar, you follow up. Follow up is key. But you can also ask this question. Is it a ridiculous idea, dot, dot, dot? You know what I'm saying? If you're trying to get something from them, you can ask that idea. Because once again, psychologically, people don't want to be rude. Is it a ridiculous idea? Because they don't want to call you ridiculous. You see what I'm saying? You're taking more of a negative approach. In fact, he utilized this, Chris Voss did. When he met this gentleman, he went through a book signing. He really wanted to have him come and be on this, uh, this show that he was doing. And he says, is it, is it a ridiculous idea that you would come and be on this show that I host, you know, as a guest, blah, blah, blah. And here he's in the middle of signing books. Next, next. But when he asked that question, is it a ridiculous idea? And then he asked for what he wanted in, in his business. The guy said, come here, come here. You know, it stopped him in his tracks. I was just talking to Giselle out here at the front desk. And I told her about the first time I met this guy named Trace Atkins. If you're a country music lover, you know who Trace Atkins is. And I was backstage and I love to watch people, right? And as he was coming off the stage, it just knocked it out of the park there in Nashville. I see all these people. Hey, can I get your autograph? Hey, can I get a picture with you? You know what I thought to myself? I'm going to brain rock Trace Atkins right now with something I just came up with on the spot, right? I'm going to stop him in his tracks. As he comes walking past me, and I know he was tired. He wanted to get off stage and go get cleaned up and all that. I said, hey, I loved you in Mom's Night Out. And it just stopped him in his tracks. This six-foot, like, giant goes, 
you saw that? <laughs> I was like, heck yeah, man. And I introduced myself and man, we just became friends, like, because it was so different. Sometimes you just got to know what to say in the right time. And I'm going to go over this book called Exactly What to Say. I listened to it twice over the weekend. You guys are going to love some of the things I'm going to throw at you here in a minute. But uh, I know we're looking at time. I want to fly through this. Uh, here's something that, I, that Kevin O'Leary taught us. He says, so much of life is a negotiation. So even if you're not in business, you have opportunities to practice all around you. Look for opportunities to practice some of these this week. Now, this is going to be an, another video I want you to watch. Now, this is a different type of negotiation. This has nothing to do with real estate, but we have everything to do with real estate by watching this. Check this out. Oh, here it comes. Shut everybody up right up front. Tell everybody to manage expectation. Anticipation is game. Day before I got married, I sat my uh, parents down. They hadn't been in the same room for 20 years. <laughs> 20 years they hadn't been in the same room. And if they were in the same room together, a, uh, uh, a German would have been resurrected to start World War III. I mean, they could not be in the same room together. But I, I brought them to my house. They said, oh, we're coming to your wedding. I said, no, you're not. Of course we're coming to your wedding. I said, who told you to come to your wedding? Did I send you an invitation? I didn't send you an invite. You are invited to my house, both of you together. We're not coming to your house. Why are you not coming to a wedding? <laughs> So what is wrong with you? You're for your parents. So I said, listen, I'm just telling you, it's very simple. You come to my house, that is your ticket to the wedding, because you are not going to create this escapade at my wedding the first time you see each other after 20 years, you run all this other stuff. So they came to my house and they sat down. It was so uncomfortable, it was entertaining. I wish I would have recorded this setting, right? So they're sitting, I'm looking at them. I can't take the smile off my face because I'm having too much fun with this. So I say, hey, uh, mom, dad, I'm going to step out. You guys got to talk and you guys got to hash it out because you guys can't have any politics at the wedding. So I step out. I am literally out for 20 seconds. They tell me, we're ready. We're ready. Come back. And so I come back and I said, what happened? We're good. I said, no problems. No. I said, okay. You guys are invited. Here's the invitation. Here's the invitation. They came to the wedding. But I told my mom that they said, mom, you have to realize in a Middle Eastern culture, a lot of times uh, moms are put, number one, before wives. I want you to know the day I get married, the following day you go from number one to number two, and it's very simple. And I don't want to hear about it. She is my number one. You are my number two. I love you, but you're not number one. She's number you're, you're number two. Okay. So this is completely different type of negotiations. What did you get out of that video? Let's talk about it. He set an expectation. He set an expectation. What was the, what were those expectations? You're going to come to my house. You're not going to fight. You're going to be number two. So these are his own parents. Did he understand the dynamics of the people with whom he was speaking, his own parents? Hadn't been in the same room in 20 years. Yeah. Did he give them an opportunity by stepping out of the room to allow them to do their own negotiating? And then he set up rules and consequences too. Yeah. He ascertained the pain. You either abide by these standards or deals off the table. You're not coming to my wedding. His own parents. Interesting. Is it okay to be a little bit of a bulldog sometimes in these negotiations and step up and say, hey, here's how it's going to go? Negotiate back. Interesting. How would you negotiate back to him if you were the parents? What have we learned so far? What could they maybe have used with him? Sympathize the way he was feeling about the situation. Sympathize the way that he was feeling about the situation. By saying, it seems to me that we have been uh, the Bickersons for the last 20 years. And you're concerned about us causing a scene. I, very good. See? And, and what she just talked about is called tactical empathy. They need to know that they're heard. And then what could, he, what could they have done in response to that? What could they have said? It's, it seems to me, or it sounds like, and then, Parents. yes. Yeah, they could say want to love and support you mm -hmm. and we're willing to put our we're willing to support you and aside and our put our interests aside, aside to uh, be there for you if we you know, promise we won't be there for this forever and their goal was what the parents to go, go, to, the go to the wedding so they could say like how are we supposed to make this work right how like how how can we get invited to your wedding they could ask the question now he kind of set the terms they already did the negotiate. We're ready after 20 seconds, but then those are some terms. I love that question. What could they have done to negotiate with somebody? Because you're going to meet some bulldogs. You're going to meet some bullies in this business. 
right? And you have to know how to speak their language. There's something that we teach called mirroring. You know what mirroring is? Anyone know what mirroring is on Zoom? Copying their body language, their speech patterns. Hmm. Yeah. So if somebody's rubbing their chin like this, and I start doing the same thing, if they got their leg crossed, maybe they're laid back on a chair. If I kind of mirror their body language, what does that do? Why is mirroring so powerful? It puts, it puts you in immediate rapport with them. Okay. So they, 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 hey, this person gets me, right? They understand. I like their energy. I like their vibe. If they're more laid back, right? If they're like on rock stars all day, guess what? You want to match that. You want to be up. You want to be sitting up because if they're like excited about something you're, and you're doing this, what's that going to do to your negotiation? This person, person doesn't care about anything I'm saying, right? We speak so much with our body language that when you're in negotiations, watch the person, mirror the person. It's like a game. I challenge you to do it with your kids, right? My kids are mostly like this. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. I have a good friend that got me into the mortgage business. He said, it's interesting. My wife even pointed this out. Why do my kids never like coming and talk to me? Right? Something that he says that he noticed that she does differently with, with their kids than he does is when they're telling them stuff about their day, she's kind of like flipping through TikTok or whatever it might be. Oh, that's cool. No eye contact. When they come up and talk to him or want to show him a YouTube video, he, he puts his phone down, he looks right at him and he says, oh, that's awesome. Let me show you what I just saw. What would that do to your own relationships if you put an extra effort in being a good listener and watcher and taking it in? What would that do for you, your relationship with your own kids? I love that, right? And I just think that's so interesting. I watch him with his kids and, and he's totally right. They totally gravitate to him and come to him for everything because he listens. Uh, you'll be such sure. a great negotiator if you'll do that. I says, the worst thing you can possibly do in a deal is seem desperate to make it. That makes the other guy, other guy smell blood and then you're dead. Close quote. Look at this one. We're going to show you one more video before we wrap this up here and show you a few words you guys can use with exactly what to say. These guys are real estate investors. There's a little bit different type of uh, negotiations here, but take a look at, listen to this. I know these guys are from Utah. Check them out. If Steven is my realtor and helping me negotiate a property, that means that if I'm the buyer and if Nate, who's filming this, he's a seller, Nate's got a realtor. And so basically his realtor, my realtor, they're going to get together and they're going to be having conversations back and forth. Now, that's what the negotiated world looks like. And here's how it typically goes down. Stephen, I want that property and I want to get it for 100 grand. So I want to offer um, 70. Let's offer 70. Sure. So here, here maybe it's list, let's say it's listed for 120, right? Chris will come in and he'll offer 70. I'll submit the offer for 70. The client will come back and say, that's ridiculous. Uh, this thing is at least worth 115. So we'll do it for 115. And then he says, well, I don't want it for 115. I want it for 80. So I'll go and you get this back and forth and back and forth. Now, every time, every back and forth is going to cost you 48 to 72 hours because every contract comes with a you have line. 48 hours to respond or else this is no longer a good valid contract. Well, and so what will happen is, is I'm, I'm going to mess around with the low balling and then it's good two days later, the contract's going to come back to me and then it's going to come back here. And we're engaging in this pathetic game. Meanwhile, someone else speaks in like a thief in the night. And what they do is they talk to the realtor, they do all the negotiating verbally, and they end up snatching it out from under you, let's just say at whatever price it's going to go for. And meanwhile, you were playing the offer game back and forth. The deal's done. Dude. The deal's gone. You don't have time to mess around in real estate with playing the traditional game when we're talking about a high stakes, good deal. Now, I have this happen actually just this week. I had someone contact me. They said, Stephen, I want to buy this home. Here's here's my offer. Would you talk to the, the sellers before they wrote up the contract or anything? I went to the sellers and I said, absolutely. Here's what we're doing. Would you take that? And they said, yes, but I need this, that. The other she said, but I need this. So before we went to contract, kind of what you're saying right now, we had already under contract pretty much. And we had all verbally worked out so that it was seamless. It was easy and not out of the games guys let me just tell you real quick negotiation although i know a lot of you probably think it's about the game and there may even be some of you that 
love the game, right? I want to I see how well I can work this person down and get the very lowest price that I possibly can. The reality is you can avoid so much time wasted and so much effort wasted by just getting into the negotiation process with your highest and best. Talk about the highest and best for just a moment. These are the two tips that we want to roll out for you. The first one is highest and best, which is if you're going to play like a real real estate investor, then you just start out with the price. Instead of playing the high low game, just jump in and communicate. This is my price and this is my best price. Highest and best essentially says, hey, I'm a professional. I know what I'm doing. I'm not here to mess around. I don't want to play the, by the way, when Steven submits that, we're looking for a 24 hour turnaround time. So that first thing just basically says, Hey, we're going to give you a real number here. This is that we've done our numbers. We know where we need to be at. And here's the beauty of playing this game. If they come back and say no dice, or well, we can't even be anywhere near that, then you don't want to get stuck in the game anyway. Yeah, you got to go and hunt down the next deal that you actually want to do. So just get real with people instead of playing the game. Mm -hmm. Tip number two that's really important is do everything verbal first. Yeah, this this verbal is so important. To, uh, we don't want to get caught in the minutia of going back and forth, like we said before. We kind of already mentioned this just a little bit, but but that verbal communication is super important. As much as you can get caught up in the contracts and the writing and making it official, before you do that, just have a real conversation. If you're if you're an investor and you're working without a realtor, then just talk to them. Say, hey, here's what I'm looking to put in. This is my highest and best. Is this something that's even in the realm of consideration for you? If they say, yes, we're, it's in the realm of consideration, then you may have something to work with there. Then get after it and talk about it and say, well, what will that look like? I could go up to here, but I would need this much in closing costs, or, or I could go down here with a little bit less, or you can do all that verbally before you get into it and actually submit the offer so that when you do, it's solid and it's going to be accepted. Like Chris said, 24 hour turnaround time, you're done. So a really good realtor actually knows how to get behind closed doors and have a real conversation that says, all right, let's be honest. Let me tell you what my buyer really wants for this. Where's your seller really at? What are you guys really able to do? Let's just find out whether we can make something happen. All of those pre-negotiations that happen verbally leads to submitting a piece of paper that goes back and gets an approval right out the gate. And we just skip the entire game. Meanwhile, while everyone else is messing around trying to play this low ball offer game, we're just getting business done. I want to talk about this real quick. Um, I went to go buy a car recently. And uh, when I sat down with the car salesman, yeah, I was I was waiting. I was waiting for the typical scenario. And I sometimes, you know, negotiation can be fun. Maybe, maybe you get a little high out of that. And I'm, I was waiting for it. I was like, okay, this is because you hear about used car sales guys, right? And, and, and the whole industry, not just used cars, but any, any car sale, you kind of, you've heard about the industry and kind of gets a bad rap sometimes. I go in there and I sit down and he tells me his price. I say, you know what? I really love it for this price. And, and I was, I was a little bawling a little bit. I was kind of playing that game. Uh, and I said, you know, I really love it for this price. He said, well, we won't go to that price. This is our lowest price. You can check the internet. You can check everywhere around. This is the best price that you're going to find for this vehicle. And, I, and he said, and we don't negotiate. Like he said that to me. He said, we just don't negotiate. And I said, okay. And I, I was trying to play hard to get, right? So I said, okay. And I turned around and said, I'll, maybe I'll come back. We'll see. And I, and I left. And when I, when I left, I went home, did my due diligence on this vehicle. And he was right. It was, it was the best price for the vehicle that I could find anywhere. I mean, anywhere of anything even close or similar. And so I came back and I said, you know what? I, I, I changed my attitude, my idea about it. It was awesome to have someone come up with full integrity and say, no, we've done all the research. We've done all the due diligence. We are professionals. This is our lowest and best that we can go. And if that works for you, great. If it doesn't, that's okay. And I'll tell you, I ended up buying the car from them. So, <laughs> so I want to tell you, I want to give you one last final bonus for this video, which is make sure you don't lose a fantastic deal over a couple thousand dollars. Yeah. You need to get really clear on what your real price is. It's not about how good of a deal you can get. It's about knowing what the deal is that you need. And it's about getting to that point and whether you can or can't. I got to tell you that I've lost many deals over $500 and over $1,000 because I got lost in the game. Um, I'm also being really attached. You said something really important there, Stephen. You evaluated your, reevaluated your attitude and you went in and you changed it. For me, when I go in on a deal, I know what I want. I know what my lowest is. And once I start that negotiation, my goal is to get it done as quick and as fast as possible inside those parameters. And if I've done that, then I've come out a winner. So know your numbers, know where you need to be at, go in for the negotiation. And remember today's two tips. The first one is 
present your best offer and make sure you communicate that you're not here to mess around, that that is your best offer. And then the second one is get as much negotiating as you can done verbally before you actually start submitting paperwork. So what'd you guys get out of that video? Like what was their tactic? How did they negotiate? You know what? I love the, um, when you're a, when you're a buyer, just give it, give it your all, give your highest and best because as a realtor, we've lost deals too over asking for a little closing costs or a home warranty or, you know, just, just give it your all, get what you're willing to, what you're really willing to pay in the end. And I love it as a seller saying, we're not willing to negotiate. So send me your highest and best. Yeah. You don't have to have multiple offers to say that. Just say, you know what? My sellers aren't willing to negotiate. So just send me your, your highest and best. I Perfect. love that. Let's just cut to the chase. Let's just cut to the chase. And these negotiations happen verbally before they got into these like back and forth. Cause you can lose out on deals that way. Correct. Right. These guys, do they sound like flippers? Wholesalers, right? They know their numbers. Heck, I just got back from New Jersey this last week and I was teaching real estate investors out there. And that's something that we taught them is you got to know what your numbers are. You have to know what your max uh, uh, offer is that you're going to put in because the numbers have to work. People lie, numbers don't. And so what you got to do is know what that number is, know what that max offer is, know what your ROI is going to be. And by knowing your numbers, you can put in the right number. And if, if, if there's a hesitation, there's something called the takeaway. It works perfectly in sales. You know, maybe this isn't the right deal for you. What did I just do to that person? Oh, I just took it off the table for him. See what I'm saying? That's, that's a tactic as well when it comes to negotiations. It's called the takeaway. There's sales books written all about that. But the thing is, is that you have to know what your value is. Know your numbers. Because of some of the things that I've taught you guys here today, I was a $14 an hour employee in Provo, Utah. And I was going in to meet with the boss to get a raise. Okay, $14 an hour. But because I knew what my value was and I was tutored by a guy that knew this guy really well, my boss. He says, here's what's going to happen. He's going to try and brain rock you. Here's how you negotiate with this guy. I went from $14 an hour to $850 a day times 155 on average days of a year. So did my salary go up? I went to salary instead of hourly. Changed my life. So the strategies that we've taught you, they absolutely Excuse work. Me. And uh, hopefully you guys have gotten a lot out of this. Does anybody else have any more comments on this video? Any more comments about those two guys? Oh, we got to get a third keyword here, Tana. Mike, I'm going to let you pick the third keyword. Negotiate. Negotiate. There it is, Tana. That's word number three. We're we just about one more. We got one more coming up here. Okay. All of life is a negotiation. Every day you are negotiating. From the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, you are negotiating. But the crazy thing is nobody ever taught us this. I tell you, kids are great negotiators, are they not? They're almost manipulative, aren't they? Boy, they know how to get that cookie out of the cookie jar from you. Like the puppy dog eyes, the emotions, ah, throwing themselves back. Guys, they are so good at getting what it is that they want. But nobody ever teaches us this. And sometimes as we get older, we big kids kind of forget what it's like to be a little kid and have fun. Kids know how to, how to have fun. If you can make somebody laugh, you're in. You know what I'm saying? If you can make somebody feel heard, you're in. But first, indeed, you need to focus on win-win solutions. There's three ways to find out uh, what they want. We can let you guys read through this as I'm going to send that to you. But um, I wanted to skip ahead and show you this guy, George Ross. <laughs> I had a chance to work with him on the road. And he taught me a lot about negotiations. He's got a whole video that's included in this slide that you guys can go watch about how he does these negotiations. He actually walked into New York into the Chrysler building because that's a deal that he did. Have you guys heard about the Chrysler building? He told me the story and, I, and my middle name is George. So I always say, we Georges got to stick together. He liked that, right? We built we, common ground there. We both were Georges. But he says, yeah, I walked in there and there's all these attorneys lined up and they're all in their suits. Right. And they all got their briefcases there. They go, where's the boss? And you know, his words were, he only shows up for big deals. <laughs> he says they didn't like that very much. But anyway, know your audience. The thing is, is that he told me, you know, about contracts. He says, Nathan, with the big print on the front, give it the little print on the back, take it away. And I always remember that. So as you start going through contracts with people, 
Give them some insight. Show them what the deadlines are and why this is important. Break it down. Educate, educate, educate. And one time this man went into Neiman Marcus and he found this beautiful necklace that he wanted to buy for his wife, right? So his tactic when it came to negotiations were these words right here. You got to do better. Have you guys ever used that in your negotiations? You got to do better. Are you bold enough to say stuff like that? Because it's almost uncomfortable if you've never taken that approach. Now, this matches the New Yorker in him. And he decided he was going to utilize this tactic he used in real estate for so many years in Neiman Marcus. So he sees this beautiful necklace and he says, oh, you got to do better. Oh, well, this is Neiman Marcus. We don't negotiate. We don't do that. I said, so who's your supervisor? You know, go get, go get your supervisor. So the supervisor finally comes down after trying to negotiate with this guy. And finally, he does the same thing. You got to do better. And the guy says, this is Neiman Marcus. Normally, we don't do that kind of thing. Aha! What was the key word he said? Normally, he was listening. And so he says, well, this is a very extraordinary uh, opportunity. You've got a beautiful necklace that I love, that my wife would love, and your price is too high. I need it to come down. So anyways, because he was able to, to click, he listened, he found the hole in the ship, he found the weak point, he was able to leverage that, and he discounted big time this necklace in Neiman Marcus. So it even works in department stores. I want to show you guys one more slide here coming up. This is that book I've been telling you all about that I just listened to. And by the way, there's a version of this book called Exactly What to Say for Realtors. I highly recommend you go get this book right here. A great realtor from Utah just told me about this this weekend, Randy. And I, I said, okay, I'm going to get it. And I listened to it twice. It's a short read, but it gives you about 25 different things. I picked some of my favorites off the list. And I wanted to kind of just bounce these off of you guys really quickly here. We got about 10 minutes left. Um, this is one that works beautifully for realtors. I'm not sure if it's for you, but have you ever used that in a sentence? I'm not sure if it's for you, but... What did I just do to that person? Did I completely disarm them? Let's just say I'm going to pitch doTERRA to somebody, right? And I say, I'm not sure it's for you, but do you like to make money? Do you like good health, right? What are they going to say to that? No, right? But what I just did is I completely disarmed. It's almost like saying, who do you know that's looking to buy a home, right? You might be hoping to pitch that person that you're talking to, but sometimes when you kind of make it feel like, hey, I'm not going to sell you, maybe it's not for you, but... That's a great phrase to memorize. I'm going to send you this list. How about how open-minded are you? Why, why would that be a good question to ask somebody? How open-minded are you of perhaps living in the ADU downstairs and renting out the top and living for free or for as little as rent? I know a guy that's doing that right now out in Eagle Mountain. They got two ADUs and an upstairs. And he gets to own it. He's living in the ADU. And after taxes and insurance, he's going to live for about 1500 bucks a month. Is that a smart guy? And he owns the place. How cool is that? So how open-minded are you of doing something that others aren't willing to do? Because if you're willing to do today the things that others won't, tomorrow you can have the things that others can't. And we can educate. But how open-minded are you of lowering the price, perhaps, or doing this? Whatever it is you're trying to get them to do, people like to always come off sounding open-minded, right? Especially in today's world. What do you know? Like if somebody says, oh man, this real estate market is just out of control. My time, blah, 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 blah. whatever negative spewing of your, about our real estate market right now. Can you challenge somebody's negativity? Or, or if they, if they bad mouth your brokerage, what can you say? How do you know? Like, what, what do you know about our, whatever program you're going to talk about? What do you know about financing or seller financing? Tell me what you know. People love to come off as experts, right? And when you give them that opportunity to do that, it's an amazing thing. How about this? Just imagine. Those words are so powerful. Just imagine, and the ones above it, how would you feel if, right? When you hear those words as a kid, once upon a time, how does that make you feel when you hear those words, once upon a time? I'm like Disneyland, right? I'm like, I have the freedom to get imaginative now, my creativity. Just imagine how you're going to feel when we hand those keys over to you and you open that door to your new life. You see what I'm saying, what I just did right there? Just imagine how your kids are going to feel when you tackle this. You know, I know that things are tough right now, but guess what? I'm just, just imagine this. You need to paint the picture. We always tell in real estate that, that views sell homes. 
kitchen sell homes. The kitchen is the warmest room in the home. The bedroom is the second, right? The closets, they sell. But here's the point. The key is you need to paint a picture for somebody. Just imagine living here and feeling this and seeing the kids playing in the backyard. It's a great sales tactic here, guys. Exactly what to say. When would be a good time? See, is now a good time? When would be a good time to blah, 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 blah. This is one he gives to you. Uh, you have three options. Why is this an important thing to say? Well, exactly. Who's ever been to In-N-Out Burger? One, two, or three. When you limit people's options or you tell them what their options are, in negotiations, my friend Ryan Smith and Jamie Smith, his wife, they walk into these investment properties, people that have the Princess Leia syndrome, you're my only hope, right? Maybe they've had their, their house on the market for three or four months and no, not one single offer. You know what these guys do? They brain rock them because they walk in there and say, you have three options. They drop three offers in their lap. I'm willing to pay full price, but the, the more money that I have to pay as the investor, the more terms I am going to put into this. Does that make, does that fair for you? So I'll pay you exactly what you're asking for, but I need this, 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 and this. But if, if you're willing to come down on price here, there's only one or two terms. Or if you're willing to, if I can pay the, the least amount, I'll buy it as is right now, sight unseen. Heck, I'll get you into another property. I'll have, you know, I'll pay for your first and last month's rent if you need to get into that situation. But he does this. He says, I, I drop three offers in their lap and people don't negotiate options. They pick them. So when you can come down and, and simplify the deal for people, okay, you got three options, right? You can either stick with that job that you hate and keep working. You can try and find another job that's going to pay you probably less for the same amount of terms or three, you can go with the term that you want. See, you painted the picture, paint the, the option that you want to have them pick as the option, okay? Um, Harjeet was just trying to call us. Let's see, um, a few more of these and we're going to wrap this up. We've got about five minutes. Uh, there are two types of people, right? <laughs> I love this one. It reminds me of Les Brown. He always says, Nathan, there's two types of people, those that are on television and those who aren't. And he was always on television. So I love that, you know, but you can say there's two types of people or, or I bet you're a lot like me. Why do people like that one? Do people like to be like fit in? They want to fit in? I bet you're a lot like me and you care about price. Am I right? That's right. See, there's that. That's right. These little wordsmiths that this guy's come up with, guys, Phil M. Jones is his name. Go get that book, especially the one for realtors. You're going to love this book. But he says, I bet you're a lot like me. And he uses a lot of the same ones in the realtor one. But, um, but people want to feel like they fit in. I bet you're a lot like me and you just want to get the biggest bang for your buck. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. Great. I, I'm glad we see, see eye to eye. And speaking of eye, uh, eye, and eye contact, there's something to be said about looking somebody in the eye. When you're doing your social media, can I just give you a little pointer? I've had to teach my own father who was raised on television. He, when he does his little videos, he's looking at himself. Can I just coach you guys really fast? Don't do that. There's a little green button typically when you're filming up here. It's right by the camera. Look at the green light because you're looking right at the camera, okay? And when somebody's watching a video, it may just be a video, but when I'm looking at you, I'm looking at my green light right now. I'm not looking down here to see all the beautiful faces on the corner. I'm looking here because it's going to be more impactful. The things that I say when I look eye to eye, in fact, there have been science, scientists right now that have said there's something about the left eye to the left eye. Try it out, see what works, okay? Pretty interesting. But um, there's also things like don't worry or most people because they want to fit in. The good news is when something goes awry, you can give good news. This is also going to be a great, uh, a great thing for you. In fact, let's go ahead and make that our fourth word, Tana. Let's make good news our last word, okay? For those that are here on Zoom, good news is our fourth word. And uh, another thing that you can also do is this. Uh, if I can, will you? Okay, who, can, who knows what I mean by that? If I can, will you? This is negotiation style. Have you ever had that one friend that doesn't want to go and hang out with everybody? They all just want to be a stay at home and just read a book or never go out and have fun with everybody. Or they make every excuse in the book why they can't come, right? And they're a good friend. You want to feel that they're included. Listen, Susie, if, if I can come and arrange a ride to pick you up at 7 p.m., we can go to Chili's together and then get you back by, you know, whatever time their TV show is going to start, right? Would you go with us? You see what I'm doing? You create solutions with negotiations, with words here. And also the word enough when they're talking about, if somebody's having a hard time picking 
something, you know, I don't know, should I get four or seven of them? Would, would seven be enough? You pick the number that you want and you ask, would that be enough? There's something about that word that's super powerful. But guys, this has been an absolute joy to get to teach you. We've got about two more minutes here of education, but hopefully you've learned something today from this. Uh, remember, tactical empathy. We want to get to that's right. Get them to say that's right. Or um, make sure that they're heard. Validate that. It seems to me or it sounds like. Utilize these things and then turn them into the problem solver. How am I supposed to do that? And then be okay with silence. You know, there's something called the law of reciprocity where you give first and then you get. You know, uh, back in the day in the 80s, um, the Harley Krishnas would go to airport, right? And one thing they would do, whether you asked for it or not, they'd come up and they would pin a little flower on your lapel, right? And then they'd stand back and they, they wouldn't say, there's like an awkward silence. And they're asking for donations. And so that law of reciprocity, somebody did something nice for me, whether I wanted to or not, I guess I'll give you five bucks. And they would, and they walk down the hallway and they take that flower off, they throw it in the garbage can, but guess what? They just go pick them up and they get them out and they pin them on another person and it worked beautifully. So there's something about that. <laughs> Giving first, when you give it yourself first, it always comes back to bless you. And that is gonna be a great thing for you in negotiations. Mike, would you come back up here? I just want them to, uh, to see you one more time. I don't know if they could see you in the beginning, but this is Mike Daniel guys. And, um, uh, there's his phone number. This gentleman is our, call him you the wizard of Osmond Home Loans or the real mortgage, Mike, right here. This guy is the guy behind the scenes, pulling it down, making it work. So if you have any need, Mike, would you tell him real fast something that we're doing to help people? Because interest rates just went back up this week. Mm -hmm. How are we saving people money and why are we doing it? Yeah, so we are offering free appraisals to anybody that can get us their documents within 24 hours interesting so yeah it's i mean one of the biggest things that we hear from from uh from realtors is how come it's taking so long to uh to get this person pre-approved and usually the reason is we're not getting our documents that we need is so, that frustrating for you guys as realtors that with your lender that is taking so long or they don't pick up their phones or this and that we kind of had to come up with a solution right now especially with higher interest rates we said how can we help solve that problem and create win-win solutions because we know that for you, you're trying to just find out what's where, what can they afford? Like, what's that magic number? Plus, if you have that letter in hand, that pre-approval letter, that means you can now put that down with offers that can actually get accepted. How much does that save the person right off the bat? Yeah, uh, we're usually five to $700. Five to 700 bucks right there, guys. So I came up with an idea the other day and I said, listen, it's not about us, Mike. It's about the realtor. And so we've put this out to realtors out there to try this hook if it makes sense for you. Say, hey, would you be okay if I saved your family between what, six to 800 bucks yeah. right off the top? Uh, sure, how? It says, well, how about a free appraisal? I've had a 100% success rate with yeses on that. So we get on the phone with Mike or Nate and guess what, we'll facilitate that. But here's the beautiful part about this whole scenario. In their minds, the realtor, you, you're the one that saved them that money. And that is so awesome. I'd rather have that all day long that they thought it was you that saved them that because it was. You're the one that brought it up. So if you want to try that, give Mike or myself a call. And by the way, uh, we're going to bring him up here. Adam, would you come on up here? I want you guys here on Zoom to also meet somebody awesome here in this business. This is a man of integrity, a hardest working man in, 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 in home warranties right here. Guys, uh, he brought us lunch here today, but I want to go ahead and just introduce Adam. Can you take a few minutes here and say hi to our friends that are here? Hi, friends. That's Tana, by the way. She's in charge. Isn't that cool? Oh, yeah, yeah. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, I just wanted to go over something, if I can, um, real quick. Um, one of the things that we did on July 1st, does anybody know it? Can they hear me or can you can you respond or can they talk? They can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We um, can hear you. Okay, cool. On July 1st, we went from our price of $600 to $700. And I just wanted to kind of go over the reasons for that. So every week, I probably get, I don't know, maybe three to four phone calls from people that are switching from another home warranty that want to come over to IBEX home warranty. And what do you think the number one reason they want to come over to IBEX? Why would they want to come over from another home warranty company? What would you Too guess? many exclusions. Yeah, well, too many exclusions or they're getting denied or so they're upset with the home warranty company um, or whatever yeah. the reason being. So 
at Ibex, we were stuck between a rock and a hard spot. And here was the situation that we have. Over the last few years, you guys have probably noticed inflation and everything that the prices have gone up. Water heaters have gone up from $350 to $400. Garbage disposals, uh, drawers, blower motors, all the things that we purchase have gone up. Our contractors are asking for more money. So we had two options. We could stay at $600, but by doing so, we'd have to be a lot more strict on the gray areas. And we 40% of the stuff that we cover is gray area. We just say, go take care of it. That's just what IBEX does. Just take care of it. Or we'd have to start nickel and diming and charging for drip pans and earthquake straps and expansion tanks and code upgrades and removal of the old ones. And we didn't want to do that either. So we raised our price to $100. We felt the blowback by going up $100 would be less significant than staying at $600 and turning into you know, Bozo, the denial home warranty company, if that makes sense, honestly. And we didn't want to do that. So I wanted you to kind of know our contractors are the best contractors. We try to get there the same day. And we don't want contractors that are cheap. We we want good contractors. We want to be fast. But we did go from six to $700. But that was allowing us to maintain and keep on covering what we cover. Our contractors, when they go out, they don't have to call the office and say, hey, is this approved? Can I do this? They don't even have to ask. They just go out there and do it because we cover everything. We cover everything 100% on this card. So they don't have to get a pre-approval. The only times that they may have questioned something is if they're going out there and they feel like it's fraud. Like somebody has said, hey, I just moved into the house. My air conditioner worked yesterday and there's raccoons living in it and it's out in the tree house. Um, okay. You know, those are the types of things they may question. But other than that, they're going to take care of it. So yeah. we're owner operators. I just want you to know I've made this promise before. I'm sure you guys have heard it is this. I say... If you guys are truthful and honest with us and just have our back, I will never let you down. You can call me nights, weekends, whenever. I will always have your back. I will always do what's right. But like I said, know that we're a local company too and we're trying to stay in business and we're trying to do things. So you know, don't lie and try to deceive, deceive us. But if you're truthful and honest with us, I'll never, ever let you down. I, I can. There's nobody above me. I don't have to ask permission from anybody. Just... I will always do what's right and, and, and make sure you look good. So anyway, but that's the reason for our, our price. Um, I always say this face right here is in the, the top 150 best looking loan officers. Oh, in thank Utah, you very much. Utah County. <laughs> what about Mike? He's in the top he, 10, right? He's in the top 100. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that's so awesome. Use these guys are great to us. And But it's hey, awesome. but thank you guys for your time. If you have questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime. Thanks. And the there's Olive Garden too. If you are on Zoom and you want to come there, there's there's more. You can drive down here and get it. So. He's got two bags of or, food right here, we'll, guys. We can mail it to you. It's <laughs> <laughs> we want to thank Ibex for being here and being our sponsor for the day. And thank you, Tana, for just keeping us all on track here today. Do you have that Google Sheet? Do I need to go ahead and share the screen or unstop on sharing it? <laughs> You're just fine. It's in the chat and I will stay on the Zoom for just a little bit longer, everybody. And then I Perfect. will send you the link and everything later as soon as everybody gets a chance. Absolutely. And we we'll, do we have the ladies that are here today sign our, our sign-in sheet and get that to you? It, it I don't need it. You just need it. Okay, perfect. We'll take care of that. And uh, perfect. Thank you guys for having us here. And uh, I'll make sure that we send Tana the... Uh, the, uh, the the presentation slides so you can all have all those videos, all these tactics, and uh, all the best to you guys in your negotiations. Thank you. Awesome. Good stuff. Thank you. And, and there we go.
Did you got my response, ma'am? I'm gonna, I will go ahead and check when everybody's um, done so that I don't lose this Zoom, but I'm sure you, I'm sure you've done just fine. I'll be able to check okay. in just a sec, but. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day. You too. Anna. Yep. Hi. We only put our keywords in the in the Google form, right? You'll need um to get credit. We need like your agent number, your first and last name, all that stuff. You have to fill on it. the Google form. Yep. Yeah. I just saw I just saw some of the words in chat, and I we don't need to put them in chat, right? Nope. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you. It was a great uh -huh. class. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye.